welcome to our five of OER Camp Global 2021. So far, we had four hours with many, many interesting sessions with a great opening. And now we will have our first keynote. And the keynote that's, I think, sometimes forgotten is not about a big talk, but keynote actually means basic questions and a framework for more discussions to come. And I guess that's what we can expect now because we invited Neil Butcher and he agreed to come and share his current thinking about open education and the educational challenges we are facing globally. I learned about Neil Butcher's thoughts when we hosted the OER conference in Berlin, I guess, seven years ago. And he was the one who came to Berlin for the closing keynote. And there was only one complaint, and it wasn't uh, to Neil, but to us, the organizers, because the complaint was there were so many interesting thoughts, and now we have to go home because it is the closing keynote. And actually, we would need two more days to discuss the ideas that we learned from Neil's keynote. So probably... It's a better situation now for everyone to know about Neil's thoughts at the beginning of our event when we have 43 more hours at OER Camp Global and of course, many, many opportunities beyond that to discuss what we have learned so far. Neil Butcher, he's based in South Africa, is a consultant. That means he is providing policy and technical advice and support for all kinds of educational institutions. Um, he used to be an employee at the South African Institute for Distance Education. I think that is now really long ago, 20 years ago or something. Uh, now he is the director of Neil Butcher and Associates, and he's working with several institutions at a global level, including UNESCO, which is important for our events today. And with the Commonwealth of Learning, uh, he works with OER Africa. He is their OER strategist. He's currently consulting the World Bank, and probably we get some insights from his work when he will now provide us with his keynote, My Journey Towards Openness, Reflections on Why We Engage with Open Licensing. We agreed to have a talk for 30, 35 minutes and the Q&A afterwards. If you have any questions and comments during the talk, please feel free to put them to the chat and I will read them out after the talk. Please be aware that the session is recording recorded, the Q&A will not be part of the recording. Now, I'm very, very excited and would invite Neil Butcher to go to the stage, share his slides, and we will learn from you now. Thanks. Thank you so much for those uh, kind words of introduction, Duran. Um, at least with a virtual conference, if I say anything that's uh, too controversial and you've got 43 hours to discuss afterwards, I can just uh, go and hide away here in South Africa where I'm based um, and where no one apparently wants to travel here anymore because we've discovered a new variant of the coronavirus. But um, uh, I'm very flattered to have the opportunity to be the first keynote speaker in this event. Um, and to, uh, as importantly, I think to share um, some hopefully new ideas uh, that I've been thinking my way through uh, as Jurens has said at the beginning, I don't see this as, as my responsibility as being trying to present a fully fledged argument, but rather to present ideas that might stimulate some thinking and, and discussion. Um, and having been trapped at my desk for a year and a half, um, I've had quite a lot of time to think about things. Um, and so I hope that I'll have something of interest to contribute to the conversations. So, um, I just wanted to start, start very briefly with some personal reflections about, uh, as I put you in inverted commas, the gift of COVID-19 as far as my personal life is concerned. Um, people who know me might be aware that I have traveled very extensively for the last 20 years or so working across the developing world, um, often in two or three different countries a month. And um, as I say here, I had a life that was characterized by global travel and a, a very busy schedule um, and I've realized now increasingly that, that what I was doing was actually very disconnected from what I've not come to understand as being important in life. Uh, and so in many ways, I was fortunate uh, also because I'm able to work virtually. I wasn't affected so much economically by the COVID lockdowns. 
Um, and they forced a radical and ultimately quite real rewarding adjustment in my own lifestyle and gave me a lot of time to reflect both on what's important to me and how the behaviors and habits in which we engage on a daily basis actually nurture what is important. Um, and, and increasingly, that observation has come to occupy center stage in my work life because I think too often uh, we actually come to believe that what ha what's important in our personal life and the way we approach our personal life is not the same as how we should run our work life. Uh, and increasingly, my opinion is that we actually can't separate them in that way. So uh, I'm still very much an early work in progress as far as that's all concerned, but there's a couple of things that I think I have at least understood um, through that journey that I, I think I, I didn't know before. And, and the first of those, and ultimately the most important, is that that everything starts with your ability to show compassion to yourself. Um, and then from there, once you're able to show true compassion to yourself, that enables you to show compassion to others. Uh, and as I start to think through the implications of that in my work life, I realize that this is actually at the center of every personal, community, national, and global developmental challenge that exists. We, we often want to look at problems in isolation. We talk about fighting climate change, for example, um, as if it's an isolated phenomenon, social phenomenon that's separate from everything else. Um, and in the same way, that's how we've approached uh, our response to COVID-19. But I think there's really no substantive solution to any serious developmental challenge that doesn't start with these principles of compassion. And that is fundamentally different from what I thought 18 months ago. I I've also become increasingly clear the decisions that we take in our personal lives that are driven by fear and holding on to old practices lead away from what's important, not towards it. Uh, in the professional space, the most obvious fear is the fear of not earning money. Um, and and I know I've realized through reflecting on my own personal life that I've often ended up doing consulting work of different kinds because I was worried that I couldn't pay the bills. Um, whenever I've been in that space, I've actually done the work that is least rewarding to me. When, on the other hand, I've tended to let go and forget about that fear, that's when I've always found the most rewarding workspaces, uh, and they've always generated a way to pay for themselves. I, I think that's important in the context of education because I think too many of our decisions about education systems are based on fear, uh, are based on the fear of letting go of what we've grown comfortable with growing up um, and, and what we're told we must do by the authorities who run the education systems. Um, and I think that that fear gets in the way of true openness, as uh, I will indicate as we move on. And then the last thing that, that I've become increasingly clear about, uh, and, and this again is important in the context of educational transformation at a systems level for me, is that if we start with a belief in a particular type of change, that belief can generate fields of practice in our own lives, um, whether it be professional or personal, that yield lived insights over time. And the more we actually do that, uh, the easier it becomes to, to move away from the things that do not resonate with our values. Um, so, so as we move from intellectual beliefs to something that's a lived insight, that, that is just a habit in our lives, uh, it becomes increasingly impossible to, to then find ourselves in a workspace that discon is disconnected from our values. I think this is very important in the context of open licensing and OERs because I think the concept of open educational resources is based very strongly on a principled set of values. And so if we don't live those values in our lives, then the ability for us to engage in the concept of openness, when in fact the work that we're doing is not propagating the values of openness becomes increasingly easy. If we let it become part of our lives on a daily basis through our daily habits, it becomes increasingly difficult to do that. And I hope through the rest of this to, to make clear what I'm saying through those experiences. So that's very much a personal journey. Moving from that into an understanding of, of what this starts to mean for education, I've become increasingly distressed by what I see happening in education systems around the world. Uh, our learners have found themselves in an incredibly difficult time with campus lockdowns, disrupted work schedules, uh, and the educators who've supported them have had, I think, almost as difficult a time of COVID as frontline healthcare workers. They've really been at the center of a tremendously stressful and difficult time over the last 18 months. But what we've seen is that our definitions of success and what it means to be successful in education and learning journeys 
has regressed back into a very traditional understanding of delivering the formal curriculum and trying to force learners and educators into distorted technological environments that are trying to push them through the curriculum as, uh, as best as possible in this strange world. And then in my view, going back to what I said on the previous slide, show no evidence of compassion at all for either the educators or the learners who are part of those systems. Now, obviously I'm generalizing and there are many exceptions, but I work extensively around the world. I'm working in 20 or 30 countries at any given time. And I feel fairly confident that what I'm saying is statistically true. And I think at the heart of that is that we have an incredibly limited definition of what constitutes success in education systems. We tend to think of focus on success very much as an academic endeavor. And to the extent that we're thinking about what success might look like after academic activities, we focus very strongly on the economic dimension of success, uh, the financial success. What, what will a person be able to do uh, in their livelihood once they've finished learning? And I think the definitions that focus on that kind of success to the exclusion of other di dimensions very significantly limit what individuals achieve and the fulfillment that they will derive from that. And again, for me, if we start to think about a concept of openness and how open licensing can contribute to true openness, I think it becomes essential that we start thinking about success in much broader terms. Um, the, those definitions, in my opinion, ought to, ta to, to take into account concept contextual and cultural terms. They also obviously would not ideally be defined in purely individual terms, given that we are social beings who depend on functional societies for our own well-being. Um, and I think that what we're seeing, um, and I think COVID is just the first phase of this, is we're starting to realize that nation states are an increasingly limiting paradigm for conceptualizing what it means to be part of human societies. Um, problems of things like climate change, the fourth industrial revolution and the economic dislocations that it causes, pandemics, obviously. These are all problems that don't respect national borders. Uh, and if we think only in terms of solving those problems by thinking about only our country and not other countries, uh, I think we're doing ourselves a massive disservice. So success, I think, needs to be reconceptualized, both at a lower level in terms of what individual success looks like and right up to a much more global definition of success. And I think that, that a number of accumulated myths about success need to be engaged and challenged as we define our own parameters for success. So if we think about what that might mean in an education system, um, I think that rather than thinking about education systems as primarily having a responsibility to graduate learners through formal curricula and, and structured programs, we might consider that one key definition of success or key goal would be to provide people the ability to define their own meaning of and criteria for success and to be able to measure those achievements, their, their own achievements against those criteria. And particularly, I think to see this as a dynamic process that shifts with changing circumstances, experience and accumulated knowledge. In other words, my definition of success as a 51 year old uh, is very different from what it would have been when I was 24. And I think rather than seeing that as a problem, we should actually be teaching people the skills of being able to continually redefine their notions of success. Our education systems are really not doing that at all at the moment. And I think at the heart of that problem is that we have built education systems on an incredibly limited understanding of what human capability is. Education systems are very, very strongly focused on developing the capacity of the rational mind. Um, in other words, that conscious part of our brain that is uh, capable of conscious thought. But if you just look through what I've got on this slide here, I think science is demonstrating to us in no uncertain terms that that very narrow focus on the rational mind is a massive understatement of the true capability of the human organism. So if you just look, for example, the conscious mind um, according to neuroscience, uh, engages in about 40 conscious bursts of activity per second, compared to a million operations per second in the non-conscious mind. We spend no time in formal education systems helping our learners or our educators to actually understand and manage what's happening in their non-conscious minds. Everything is focused on helping them to control rational thought in their conscious minds. It's very clear increasingly that that focus sets people up for failure, not for success in the long run, in a, in a wide range of ways. Um, we also see, though, that, that that brain 
is connected right throughout our body with a number of nervous systems uh, and flows through also into our gut biome. Um, those of you who, who followed COVID with interest, as I have, will, will see the extent to which the connection of different elements of our body has a very significant effect on the way in which COVID has tended to affect people. And at the heart of a lot of that is what's happening in our gut biome and, and what's often called the second brain that's working there. So if we're not teaching people how to manage that integrated system effectively and how to use it in order to make sure that the rational mind can actually function optimally, we're really not comprehending even remotely what true human success looks like. And I think the emerging knowledge on epigenetics, which obviously is at the heart of the RNA vaccines as well in many respects, um, is showing us how uh, behaviors and our behaviors in the environment can cause changes that affect how our genes work. Um, and again, we're not engaging with this at all. We're still continuing to run our schooling and university systems uh, off learning paradigms and knowledge bases that are based in theories from 15, 20, or even more years ago, and that have taken no account of what we've learned on the scientific front. So, so I think education systems have become incredibly rigid and closed, um, and that then raised questions for me of what we mean about open licensing. So I think when we think about journeys to openness, we actually have to start by asking what we think the real building blocks of success are, given everything that we have learned in the last 20 years, the vast majority of which has absolutely no role to play in the design of modern education systems. And we should keep returning to that question every step of the way. In other words, we shouldn't allow proxies to come into place that swap one thing out for another thing. In the world of open educational resources, I think the single biggest mistake that we've made is we have tended to confuse the use of open educational resources with the quest for openness in education systems and assume that simply by using open educational resources, we are actually creating more open education systems that will enable people to achieve success on something along the lines of the kinds of definitions and uh, parameters that I've supplied in the last few slides. So, sorry, that may all seem quite esoteric to you all, but I actually think it's fundamental to the redesign of education systems. We have to recognize, and COVID has given us the opportunity to recognize, just how dysfunctional, closed, and rigid our education systems are, and how resistant they are to the new ideas, innovations, and changes that we know of uh, in knowledge networks but that do not permeate through our education systems at all. And we need to stop pretending that just because we're using open licenses, that somehow that means we're affecting meaningful educational transformation. We have to keep coming back every time with every decision we make to ask ourselves the question, is what we are doing likely to lead learners to long-term life success in a broadly defined set of dimensions? Or is it simply replicating what we've done in the past, which has not served our purposes, which has made a major contribution to exacerbating the dreadful effects of the COVID pandemic because of the ways in which people have responded to it because they haven't developed the capacity to learn how to think and behave differently. And we need to learn from that to make sure that when we get into the next round of global crises, which I think climate change is most likely to be the, the, the single most likely candidate to force us to a next level uh, of development. We need to make sure that we have education systems that are helping people to learn in ways that prepare them for that world, not for the world of 100 years ago for which these education systems were designed. So for me, an open learning in, in education systems is really about a number of key principles which exist in tension with one another. Um, Learner-centeredness is one. The, the principle of lifelong learning and preparing people for lifelong learning, not just focusing them on achieving the qualification. Flexibility of learning provision. Um, we've seen some great success stories with how flexibility of learning provision has enabled people to learn in these difficult times. Um, but flexibility, I think, means many other things as well. It means that we shouldn't only think of learning as happening through formal educational systems and processes. People learn in a number of ways. And if you look back at that, 
kind of structure of the human organism that I presented to you earlier, we are actually designed to learn as a species. The problem is our education systems have systematically destroyed our capacity to learn as an integrated organism. Um, and, and what we need to do is to recapture in our education systems a nurturing for that learning capability, because that is actually innate in human capacity, in my opinion. And so that also would then mean that we would seek to remove barriers that, to accessing learning. We've got lots of technologies to enable us to do that, but we're, we're not using them effectively for that purpose. We're using them to replicate traditional models and systems, recognizing uh, what people have done before and giving credit to it, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a number of different principles that cluster around the concept of open learning. In the world of OER, though, we very often tend to say that open education practices are practices that involve the use of open educational resources. Thank you.